actually turn over to our public health hygienist, Vanessa Bopp, who is going to walk through the objectives, all of the content for today, present a case presentation, and then open for question and answer. If you should have any questions during this session that you would like to put in the chat box, I'm happy to read those to Vanessa when we get to the Q&A. So thank you again all for joining us, Vanessa. Hello, everybody. I am Vanessa Bopp, like Shonda said. Um, we'll go ahead and get started today. Um, the objectives for today is to reduce the risk of caries transmission from mother to child and counsel patients about the safety of common dental intervention in pregnancy, uh, improve dental care access, and uh, pregnant women through interprofessional collaboration. So why is it um, important to discuss oral health with expecting parents? I don't know how many of you today are parents or who is not, but uh, I will share with you a simple way to think of today's lecture. As a parent or caregiver, we always want the best for our kids and want to protect them from harm. For today's lecture, I have chosen a superhero theme for my slides because by taking, talking to our parents, who patients who are parents or will soon be parents, we are helping keep children and families safe. Our mission as heroes and ultimate goal is to reduce the risk of caries transmission from parent or main care caregiver to child. The maternal child link. Dental caries is a transmissible disease. In my experience of talking to parents and family about the vertical transmission of caries causing bacteria, I get many surprised reactions and is often new news to them. Mothers are the main source of passing the bacteria responsible for causing caries to their offspring due to more intimate contact. Mothers with high rates of caries pass the high oral bacteria load and dietary habits on to their babies early in life, often by six months of age. It is through the transfer occurrence via saliva contacts such as tasting, licking the spoon, or kissing the baby on the mouth. The higher the level of maternal bacteria, the more likely the child is to acquire the bacteria. Mothers with poor oral hygiene and more tooth decay are more likely to pass on the caries causing bacteria. If colonization of the baby is delayed until after two years of age, then the amount of caries at age four tends to decrease. This is a great reason for the need of getting dental care during pregnancy. It is an important risk modif modification strategy. Caregivers with high bacteria levels also usually have bad habits like contributing that contribute to caries and often pass these habits on as well, like high frequency of sugar intake, poor oral hygiene, and high levels of decay. Fathers can theor theor uh, theoretically, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> pass on the bacteria, but studies of mom, dad, and baby baby triad show that the bacteria more often comes from the mom. Reduce, reduce the risk. Dental caries is the most common chronic disease of childhood. In fact, it is five times more common than asthma. Untreated caries can lead to local and systemic complications such as infection, pain, of course, nutrition and growth challenges, trouble sleeping, and poor self-esteem. These are all consequences of copious caries that we have covered in our previous webinars, but I wanted to remind you exactly what we are protecting our children and families from. What can be done? There is promising evidence to show that caregivers can decrease 
their risk of passing on the bacteria that causes caries to their children by decreasing their own caries levels. Promising strategies include receiving regular comprehensive dental care during pregnancy because caries causing bacteria are passed to infants as early as six months of age, limiting the frequency of sugar in the diet, maintaining excellent oral hygiene and using fluoride containing toothpaste. And um, also using preventive agents such as a topical fluoride rinse like mouthwash um, that contains fluoride. There is also um, uh, xylitol containing gums. If you chew those four times a day, um, you can get actually help diminish the amount of the bacteria growth in your mouth. And there's also xylitol lo lozenges and lollipops. It prevents the bacteria from colonizing. Oral conditions in pregnancy. If you are performing an oral screening to a pregnant person, you may see some oral conditions that are more common in pregnancy. A pregnancy granuloma. A pregnancy granuloma is, an un, is uncommon and occurs in only 5% of women. It appears red, swollen, and pimple-like. It will bleed easily if touched and usually develops on the gingiva. This usually develops as a response to local irritations such as poor hygiene, trauma, or an overhanging restoration. Increasing estrogen and prostroestrogen, sorry guys, <laughs> levels during pregnancy exacerbate the condition. The treatment, there's usually no treatment um, necessary for this because usually when the hormones go back to level after pregnancy, this will um, usually take care of itself. But if it becomes a problem for um, eating or is just painful, then it can be removed. Hyperemesis gravidarium is something more common that you may come across. The gastroesophageal reflex and excessive vomiting are more common in pregnancy and can cause enamel erosion. To manage this, um, you can rinse with water uh, bicarbonate to reduce the acid in mouth immediately after vomiting. Despite everyone's want to brush their teeth immediately after vomiting, it's recommended that you do not. Why? Because when you vomit, stomach acid may remain in your mouth. By brushing your teeth, merely scrubbing the acid into your teeth. Instead, you can use a baking soda mouth rinse that will reduce the acidity in your mouth effectively. If you throw up and don't have baking soda around, rinsing your mouth with water is the next best option. After waiting for about a half an hour, you, it should be safe to break out your toothbrush. The mixture for the baking soda rinse, uh, you can ask your dental uh, professional what they would recommend, but I did find um, something online. What they recommended was one fourth of a teaspoon of baking soda, um, one teaspoon of salt, one cup of warm water, and then you just like swish and spit with that until it's gone. The, um, on this picture, I wanted to kind of bring your attention to the bottom mandibular anteriors. You can see kind of the layers of the teeth. You see the white um, outlining of the tooth and then there's the more kind of yellowish of the tooth. That's actually the second layer of the tooth. You're looking at the dents in there. So they have completely um, eroded away the enamel layer on the lingual side of those anteriors. 
And uh, this is something you would see more with like vomiting. Um, also, if you have a acid reflex problem, you can notice something similar to this, but it's more, it starts more in the posterior teeth and the acid tends to pool in the, in the crevices of the teeth. So that would be the first place you would see it. And then it eventually makes like a cupping of the, um, the posterior teeth on the top of the tooth. And also another interesting thing might be only me, but I think it's very interesting. The, um, but also you see those bumps that kind of look like bubbles behind the anterior teeth. That is actually tori is what it's called and it's extra growth of the um, bone. So those are actually um, bubbles of bone there. And um, some people have them their entire life and it doesn't bother them. And some people have to have them removed surgically. The effects of periodontal disease on pregnancy. So this is a wonderful graph. I um, do get my information from um, Smiles for Life teaching curriculum and I got this from there. I think it explains things very well. The mechanism of preterm birth. Um, numerous studies have documented an association but not causation between maternal periodontal disease and preterm birth and low birth weight. There are several potential explanations for this association. Uh, periodontal disease could have direct effect on the uterus through bacteremia causing chromioamniotosis. However, the, the indirect mechanism mediated by systemic inflammatory response is more likely. The bacteremia, the direct mechanism, is um, the periodontal infection of the mouth may have a direct effect on the uterus through bacteremia causing direct infection of the amniotic fluid. Case studies have even found oral bacteria in am amniotic fluid cultures, but this is not a common place. Uh, the systemic inflammatory response, the indirect mechanism, is postulated that the major effect of the mouth on preterm birth results from a systemic inflammatory response to periodontal infection that increases prostaglandins and interleukines to affect labor initiation. Inflammatory response may lead to placental blood flow restriction, placental necrosis, and consequent in low birth weight. A similar mechanism has been proposed to explain the association seen between periodontitis and increased rates of heart disease and diabetes. How are we doing? Is there any questions, Shonda? No, keep going. Thank you, Vanessa. Okay. Uh, so the bottom line is the periodontal disease is associated with preterm birth and low birth weight. Periodontal treatment during pregnancy has not been shown to improve birth outcomes. The periodontal treatment does improve the women's oral health. The periodontal treatment is safe during pregnancy and um, need, there is a lot, there's a a lot more need for this type of research. That's why um, we are still saying there's an association, but there's still some, um, they can't say that it causes it, but we are definitely seeing some association. And dental treatment in pregnancy is safe. I think um, a lot of the mothers that I talk to, they, a lot of them have concerns about seeking dental treatment while they're pregnant. They think that they need to wait until after the baby's born. And I think this is something that really needs to be passed around more and some education given to uh, pregnant patients. Um, there is a dental disconnect. Women frequently do not go to the dentist when they are pregnant. Uh, Here's some uh, interesting facts. Only 26 to 34% of all pregnant women visit the dentist. 
Percentage is even lower in Hispanic women, low socioeconomic status, and those not aware of oral systemic linkage. Only 50% of women in a, with a dental problem visit a dentist, even among women with dental insurance. Dental care related uh, decline during pregnancy. Treatment guidelines. There's a, a clear national consensus on the approach of prenatal oral health, the importance of addressing it across the lifespan and especially in pregnancy. It, and clarity around the safe of dental procedures during pregnancy and there it, it is given in two documents. In the 2012 oral health care during pregnancy expert work group, oral health care during pregnancy, a national consensus statement, summary of expert work group, which are endorsed by the American Dental Association and the American College of Obstetric and Gynecology, sorry, and the 2013 American College of Obstetric and Gynecology Committee Opinion Oral Health Care During Pregnancy and Through the Lifespan. These documents clarify that the past majority of dental care, that a vast majority of dental care is safe throughout pregnancy, and it is important for women and their babies. The American Congress the ACOG, I'm going to say, <laughs> uh, a dental, they, they state a dental checkup early in pregnancy will help encourage that your mouth stays healthy. Pregnant women are at least at, at an increased risk for cavities and gum disease. Uh, some treatment tips that I bring up to some patients are uh, in the first trimester, uh, especially um, is like the most um, opportune time to seek dental treatment, um, especially in states where adult women have access to dental care insurance only while pregnant. Care should be given um, early if they think there's going to be like an extensive treatment plan so that we um, can work our way through the treatment plan as the pregnant pregnancy progresses. Schedule, if you're in the beginning of the pregnancy, you want to schedule your, their, they want to schedule their um, dental visits more in the afternoon to avoid anything like morning sickness. Um, that is pretty common in women. Um, the second trimester, again, is ideal for dental care, especially if you are having problems with morning sickness, then the second is a good time also. The fetus is not large yet, and it makes it uh, easier for the mother to sit in the recline, the dental chair, and be reclined for long periods at a time. They're not really experiencing like trouble breathing yet or anything like that from the baby pushing up. Um, in the third trimester, then it starts to get kind of tricky. Um, if it is absolutely necessary for them to be having treatment at that time, then we usually uh, have the patient kind of slightly turned to the left side with a towel propped up underneath them. We kind of have some blankets or a little um, round towel that we can put underneath them to turn them on the side. And, and also if they need to make an appointment, I always tell the, the women that um, when they're making the appointment to let them know that you may need a longer appointment because you need more breaks. You'd like to get up and walk around a little bit if it's gonna be like a long appointment, but if it's, um, or let them know that you might have some trouble breathing so that you need to justify getting up and walking around. Uh, women that I've worked on at um, this stage in pregnancy, I actually um, almost had them sitting straight up in the chair and I would stand up myself and it's awkward 
um, as a professional, but you do what you got to do to make sure that they get some care if it's needed. So there is options out there and you will not be, they, I want uh, the mothers to feel comfortable going in at that point if it's necessary. Dental radiographs, this is always a big scare for moms. Um, you mentioned radiation to someone and people's ears go up. I, uh, they, I don't think people realize how low the exposure is with dental x-rays. It's definitely something that is decided if it's necessary um, at the time. Uh, radiation exposure is extremely low during dental radio radiographs. Patients and their unborn children are generally at higher risk for the oral disease affecting the pregnancy than they are from radiation exposure. So we usually weigh it out whether um, they're at higher risk of any, any of the complications that we talked about previously, if we were not to take an x-ray. But again, the, the, the dose of uh, radiation is so low, it's actually considered almost um, unmeasurable. Uh, radiation exposure to the fetus from dental x-rays is so low that it cannot be measured by conventional techniques, like I said. Um, procedures, uh, the dental x-ray as, as x-rays as necessary to make diagnosis, consider delaying the effect of x-ray until after pregnancy. Um, proper radiographic techniques can be used to minimize the exposure. Uh, you can absolutely wear the lead apron. That's kind of standard procedure. And then sometimes I would even lay an extra one over um, the tummy. I don't know that um, that is the general rule, but I would, I just did it sometimes to give, make the mother feel more comfortable. Preventive agents, fluoride uh, inhibits bacteria growth and strengthens enamel. Used uh, topically and to prevent dental caries. It can be used topically and prevent to the dental caries. And the xylitol we talked about a little bit um, earlier that it's in gum. Um, it decreases levels of bacteria in the saliva and the plaque. And um, chewing sugarless gum stimulates saliva, which assists the neutralization of acid and remineralization of the tooth enamel. Chlorhexidine is also something that you could talk to um, your dentist about if they think it would be something that would be necessary for you. It's mostly just mostly used for if you have a periodontitis, but um, if they or some type of infection that's uh, a dangerous infection for the tooth. So you could ask your uh, dentist about that, or you can also, they probably would just bring it up if they feel it would be necessary. What can we do as a team? So um, asking questions really, um, just when you're asking, when you're doing those um, beginning questions, when you're first sitting in the patient, ask them, do you have any oral health issues currently? If they say yes, then um, make the referral and give the patient contact information for a local dentist and uh, ask them when, when they last saw a dentist or when their last cleaning was. You kind of have to make sure you ask a few more questions than just last saw a dentist because that can be kind of tricky sometimes. Um, if it's been more than six months, then you can make a referral or just uh, um, give them the information in the local dental office again. And if it's been less than six months, then just kind of remind them that they need to be making their next appointment or make sure that it's in the books because after the baby is born, life gets crazy and uh, sometimes that um, next appointment gets missed. Integrating oral health into pregnancy clinical exam. Patient screening. 
When screening a patient, follow these steps. Evaluate oral health risk history. Perform an oral health exam. Document findings in prenatal record and share with the dentist if referring. Include oral handouts in the prenatal packet. Some patient anticipatory guidance is encourage patient to maintain good oral health habits and healthy dietary practice. Some guidance um, you can give are brush the teeth brush with soft toothbrush twice daily with a fluoridated toothbrush, floss daily, limit sugar intakes and drinks to mealtime only, choose xylitol gum four to five times per day, establish a dental home for the family, visit to dental home every six months, more or less often is um, based on the dental team. If some people need to go more than six, um, more than two times a year, that's usually um, told to you by your dentist if they think you need to come more often. And during pregnancy, sometimes you can go an extra time uh, because you, because of the fluctuation of the hormones, you get different responses kind of like what we talked about before, but if you started out with mild gingivitis before you got pregnant, then things seem to, they get more um, exacerbated when you're pregnant. And so then it turns into a, a more aggressive gingivitis. Or if you start with gingivitis, then you're at high risk for it to turning into periodontitis, just because um, things seem to get a little bit more upset, as I would say. Um, during the pregnancy because of the hormonal flexation. Uh, and then also don't forget to talk to the patients uh, about managing the oral complications of vomiting and rinsing the mouth with water or the baking soda recipe we talked about and remind them not to brush their teeth uh, right after vomiting. And also I'd like to bring up to moms because sometimes pregnant women, they um, develop interesting uh, habits. They increase their sugar intake. They get different cravings. If they notice themselves having, or they sometimes women feel like they have to eat more frequently because they're nauseous. That is um, something that you want to mention to the dentist or they want to mention to the dentist if they go and the dentist might consider writing them a prescription for a prescription for a toothpaste to give them some extra protection. But if that's not the case, then just want to encourage them to brush their teeth and at least sometimes three times a day if they are eating that frequently. So here we are to our case. This picture here, um, things that I want you to see. So we're going to pretend this patient came to us in the in the clinic today for their prenatal appointment. And when you ask them to open their mouth and uh, you're looking at their teeth, the first thing that we should see here is along the mandibular anteriors here. You can see kind of the swelling. It's more red and um, it's not really the nice pink and you also see more like a v at the bottom instead of the nice u so you can see some inflammation there and then there's also some plaque and staining around along the gum line you can see some yellowing on there so my question to them would be when was your last dental appointment and if they if it then we go back to um asking the questions that I talked about previously. If it's been more than six months, then we can, you can dig a little bit further, say, ask them, do they have dental insurance? If they don't have dental insurance, depending on where you live, sometimes you are covered while you are pregnant um, with the state. So uh, have them look into that. And uh, also if they, if they 
if the insurance is not the issue and they just need to make an appointment, then stress that they need to make the appointment because they need to knock down that bacterial count before the baby is born. And explain, I would go into explaining how the bacteria can be passed on to their child and the sources of how it can be passed on through uh, the licking of the spoon, kissing on the mouth, taste testing the food, that type of thing. And so also one other thing that I would consider if you're looking at this patient and they're older and they could possibly be going through uh, menopause, this kind of the hormonal fluctuation, like I was talking about early, that can also happen if you are going through menopause. So it's not, I know it's a little off subject, but I also wanted to bring it up too, cause it's hormonal related. And this kind of stuff, it, your, um, the gum tissue can get irritated the same way as it could during pregnancy. So um, if you're, talking to a female, I'd bring that up also. And then uh, referring this patient would be, you could ask them uh, where they live, if there's a dental office that is close to them, if that, if they have any transportation issues, then we wanna pick the one that's most close to them. And then we can refer that patient to that dentist. And when we refer, when we refer that patient to a dentist, uh, we would send along whatever kind of medical records that we could to help inform the dental office that this patient is a pregnant patient. There's so many weeks along, try and give all that information to them to kind of give them a heads up on what this patient is dealing with. And then I want to also talk about Smiles for Life. Like I said, this is a wonderful program and I do use information from the Smiles for Life teaching curriculum. It is amazing for all professionals and I think everyone should at least do one of their modules. Any one of them is very informative and it's a good resource. So that is the end of everything for me. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And I'm gonna encourage all of you to utilize the chat box as well. And I'm happy to read those questions to Vanessa. Uh, I'll get us started, but please do just take yourself off mute, turn on your camera or enter them into the chat box. And I, I will start. So Vanessa, you had uh, mentioned that you know your role is you're actually integrated into a medical dental integration model where you can visit with patients and see patients. What do you what have you viewed or seen or heard from the medical providers or the the medical residents as something they hadn't really thought of before about oral health and overall health? Uh, I think mostly it was the transferring the bacteria. A lot like families and even the medical residents, they didn't think of the connection there about how um, if the parents have bad oral health or a high um, bacterial count in their mouth, then they can pass it on to the child. When I talk to them, I get pretty much the same reactions uh, from them as I do the parents that I'm talking to. It's uh, usually a surprise to people. I know a question that's come up before is, uh, not in this session, but when I was in previously on the, a very similar topic was what about those pacifiers when they hit the ground um, and you're uh, at church, you're at the park, and you're somewhere where that pacifier needs to enter their mouth again. What's the recommendation uh, for parents, pregnant moms, or uh, anyone else in that situation? Yes, good question. Um, definitely do not stick it in your mouth and clean it off, because <laughs> I think that used to be um, something that would be common. Uh, the recommended thing is to wash it off with some soap. And if you don't have soap around, tuck it away, put it away until you can get to some soap. Can you talk a little bit about how safe 
drinking water is, fluoridated water for uh, people in general, but people who are pregnant, is there any risk to drinking fluoridated water? There is no risk. It is actually a very great idea uh, to drink fluoride water. It's one of those topical um, exposures of the fluoride that I mentioned earlier. And um, that way it gives the mother extra protection on their teeth. And that is a great, great thing to have during pregnancy. Like I said, some um, pregnant women develop, uh, they want to eat frequently or is the frequent vomiting. So if you're drinking a fluoride, fluoride water, it's just extra protection. And I would definitely suggest it. And uh, that's it. So another question, when it would be your ideal scenario for like OBGYNs, when they're working with uh, women who are expecting or pregnant and they're coming into their annual, or not their annual, they're coming in for their exam once they are, you know, realize that they're pregnant. You kind of mentioned that's a great time to begin the conversation and talk about good oral health, but those appointments are pretty frequent, especially toward the end. So what would be your recommendation for, you know, what should be done at each of those appointments and how often do you ask these types of questions and at which appointment and should you look in the mouth for all of these appointments? What would be uh, your recommendation as a public health hygienist? Yeah, another good question. Um, so I think the best time to talk to these moms would be the appointment where they have to have their sugar glucose tested. They usually have to hang around for a while after drinking that solution and they have to kill time anyway uh, before they can be tested again. And to, so to um, do that education in that time period is a great time. Um, or also the first one, the first uh, appointment, because they're more tolerant at that time. They're not uncomfortable. They don't, they can sit still for a long time. And um, then they're, they're just not hit with so much all at once. And you don't, I definitely wouldn't um, recommend it every appointment. Absolutely, like you said, they, uh, they frequent the doctor pretty often. So I don't think that needs to be something that needs to be discussed at every prenatal appointment. But the one that I found is the best is the, the blood, the, the glucose level check is a pretty convenient time. And can you expand on that a little bit about looking into the mouth? So that covers a lot about the education and when to talk about the importance of oral health. But what about looking in the mouth? Because you shared with us some really good cases of what to look for and what you see. So how often should uh, we expect to look in the mouths for pregnant persons? Uh, because of the fluxation of the hormones, I honestly don't know a time period that is not ideal. I honestly, I, that, there's really, it's when the hormones start elevating and that's the, the most, uh, when, when things start to elevate. When the beginning of the pregnancy, uh, you get more an idea of what you're starting with. Uh, if you're starting with a healthy mouth, if you're starting with an unhealthy mouth, unhealthy gum tissue, then uh, you can watch it again at the next appointment or if they did have unhealthy gum tissue or uh, a broken tooth, something that could be high risk for an abscess like, uh, uh, like a broken tooth or a large uh, obvious decay in a tooth that could definitely uh, get exacerbated pretty easily and pretty fast. So if you start with something that could be a concern, looking in the mouth every time, I would say it would be acceptable. But if you start out with a healthy mouth, then you don't need to look in the mouth every time. And you can absolutely ask, do you have any dental concerns at this time? 
for every appointment. That can be um, part of your routine questions that you ask during uh, taking the, the vital signs. And that would prompt you to look into things farther or you can maybe uh, get them to share some information with you that they wouldn't have otherwise. Thank you. Are there any questions on the line for Vanessa? I'll pause a minute before I keep peppering her with questions that are coming in to me through the chat. Okay, well, my next question then, Vanessa, is that in some healthcare facilities, a lot of times, you know, women who are uh, not yet pregnant, but could be planning for pregnancy. What do we do in that scenario? What are the best conversations to have and when and where? And uh, what, what type, of, type of environments can we start having these conversations? Yeah, if you have a patient that's considering to start um, trying to get pregnant, uh, starting with an oral, having a healthy mouth is definitely one of the things that you want to uh, put put as a priority for them or to, to have because uh, and educate on how things can get um, out of hand faster while you're pregnant. Then um, also, I, you know, a perfect example, I think sometimes uh, that some of the younger moms, if I saw a patient once that their wisdom teeth were starting to come in, and they were talking about uh, trying to have a child and they had no idea that their wisdom teeth were starting to come in. They didn't know they even had wisdom teeth. And I explained to them that sometimes when you are pregnant and something like that happens, you're naturally you're gonna have an increase in inflammatory inflammation even if you weren't pregnant, but when you're pregnant and that starts happening, you're gonna have a, an exaggerated response. So I suggested for her to go and get her wisdom teeth checked out to see if they have enough room to come in, if they're gonna to need to be extracted. And also when the wisdom teeth come in, they and there is inflammation around that tooth, it can affect the tooth next to it because the gum tissue is not setting nice and tight around that tooth and there's more room for that bacteria to pack around that tooth and affect the tooth right next to it. So it's, you could um, educate on oral hygiene like that. So that would be, that's just something that came to my mind when you asked that question. I hope I answered that correctly, but that was a perfect example of that. No, I thank did. you. The, the case presentation is great. Thank you for that. Another question I have is about late in pregnancy. Is it appropriate to talk to mom about caring for an infant's teeth or talk to both parents uh, about caring for an infant's teeth toward the end of pregnancy uh, or before taking the baby home? Is this a conversation to be had in the hospital? And when and how can we begin those conversations? Okay, so um, when the mom is, they're really close to having the baby. I. I, I would bring it up then. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because uh, especially if it's a first child because they don't really know what to expect and um, you can just uh, talk about um, the making sure that everyone has um, healthy teeth, not only the mom. Uh, I kind of forgot to talk a little bit about dads. Like I said, dads, they're not um, usually the most known source to pass on the bacteria, but they still need to be considered. Dads, uh, you can also bring up it then that the dads need to make sure that their teeth are healthy because once the baby comes in, things get crazy and they forget to go to their dental appointments. That tooth that was bothering them a month ago, they're probably not gonna go in until later because things are so crazy. So it's uh, important to seek dental treatment before the baby comes into their life and into their daily routines. Uh, when the baby's going home, absolutely, because you can talk about things like the pacifier and don't put the pacifier in their mouth. And then um, also you can even bring up 
like testing the food or I know the baby's going to be a while before it's going to be a while before they start um, eating food, but you can still bring up different ways that it can be passed to the child. I know sometimes the bottle, even the nipple on the bottle, if that gets dirty, I've seen people lick that off. So you can talk about the nipple on the bottle, about keeping that clean and different sources also. Did I answer all the questions? Yeah. And I suppose wiping the gums too. I remember you saying that in one of the sessions too. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so Wiping down the gums is a great thing um, at bedtime, or uh, you can do it twice a day. It knocks down the bacterial count in the mouth, and it also gets the child used to you, like messing around in their mouth, and it will be to your advantage in the future when you start trying to brush their mouth and brush their teeth because they kind of know what this is all about, and they're already used to it. But um, wiping down them gums is, uh, it makes a difference. You can knock down that bacterial count in their mouth. And especially if the mom or a main caregiver has that high bacterial count and it could possibly be passed on to them, just wipe down their mouth, it's an advantage. Okay, another question. Is there any uh, different recommendations you would give to uh, moms who plan to breastfeed and moms who plan to bottle feed? Are there different recommendations for how to care for the infant's mouth based off of either of those? So breastfeeding versus bottle feeding, um, the bottle actually, it tends, the, the milk tends to pool in the mouth more. So if the child has teeth or a couple of teeth, they get exposed to the formula or the breast milk, whatever is in the bottle for a longer period of time. And then you could have, uh, you have that acidic uh, reaction that happens in the mouth from the carbs that are in the formula. Breastfeeding, you, they, research says that they have more, of, there's not as much pooling because they, you have to have the sucking mechanism to um, have the milk come out. So it's not pouring in their mouth usually. So that is the difference. You still would wanna wipe down the gums just like you would the bottle versus uh, breastfeeding. Thank you. And how, what kind of tips would you give to having conversations with uh, moms about the safety of having an X-ray done or the need to have an X-ray done? Uh, who can have that conversation and how, and what would you say to convince them one way or the other about the need for an oral x-ray? Well, like I said, it's usually determined at the dental office whether there is a need for x-rays. If uh, when I worked in the um, dental office, we would decide uh, when was the last time they had a dental x-ray done? Can we just look at their last x-ray and maybe decide was there a cavity previous, previously there that they never took care of? And how bad was it at that point? So if it was kind of close to the nerve at that point and the x-ray was a long time ago, then they would probably consider taking another one, but it would be localized just to that tooth because the risk of the oral infection is higher than the very low minimal risk of the radiation, which is very low. And like they said, uh, almost unmeasurable. And so a lot of times the doctor will opt out of taking x-rays unless it's absolutely necessary. And if you, if the mother has any concerns on taking x-rays, I advise them to just express those uh, concerns to the dentist and let the dentist decide what is necessary and what is not. Great, thank you. What can you say about uh, the benefits of having a sort of medical dental integration? So having you on site and able to have these conversations compared to the providers needing to be the ones to ask these questions. Uh, and as a somewhat of a follow-up, another question that was here, it's related to medical records and speaking between the, the individual's primary care provider, their OBGYN, the pediatrician, and then the dentist. And you know, what would be the ideal scenario and how can we make sure that the right care is being given? 
So I'll start with the first one, the advantage of having uh, me in this environment. Uh, it is, so the, the, the medical residents, if they're, they have a question on uh, something that they're looking at, I'm not quite sure what they're looking at, then they can just pull me in the room and we can look at it together and come up with an idea of what's going on. Sometimes that's helpful. You know, I know sometimes I'm sure um, I, me, myself, I wish uh, that there could be someone just looking over my shoulder <laughs> and giving me advice, you know, but the, I think that's the, the best thing. And then sometimes out in the community, the patients, they, they want to talk to a dental professional about teeth and that just like uh, if you're having some heart problems, you want to talk to your cardiologist. Then, so having that dental person on site, I think it's comforting for the patient. It makes them feel like they're getting a well-rounded experience and exam and information, but also being able to educate the medical residents on what to do in certain scenarios is it's priceless because that information can, they can take that on into their profession and they will know how to uh, approach things in the future, hopefully. And the second question, I don't remember exactly what that was, Shonda, like coordinating things maybe? Essentially coordinating in, in, in an integrated care. And you've kind of mentioned that as if the hygienist is there already, but what kind of capacity do we have right now to share medical records between a dental provider and an OBGYN and uh, primary care? And um, if we can't share very much, what would, you know, what could we possibly be missing? Uh, as far as the referral process goes, that is a challenge. It's a challenge that I deal with myself, um, but the way that I have worked with it is the, the medical software that I have been dealing with didn't really have a process workflow worked into it that works for that scenario, like a dental uh, nurse or a dental hygienist going referring to a dentist or that type of thing. But the, the information that the dentist will want is a medical history. And they want their uh, list of medications. And that alone is huge information to share between interprofessionally for the dentist. And that way they know if they have had any heart conditions or if they need a, 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 like an antibiotic before they come in and have their dental treatment, they could see that on the medical chart. The communication between the medical and the dental software, it's, it's, it's uh, not friendly. I wish that there was more out there and there might be that I don't know about, but I haven't, uh, there is barriers. To, to actually do it electronically, but usually just doing it the old fashioned way. And what I found is just faxing it over. And that's the communication. Uh, every state has different uh, things that they can work with too. Maybe you can do teledental 